Hi everyone, so this will be a quick talk on hypothyroidism, which is obviously a reduction of thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is comprised of T3 and T4, both are secreted by the thyroid itself. And most of the T3 and T4 is bound to a protein known as thyroid binding globulin, which is sort of a secondary regulator of the activity of thyroid hormone. When the hormone is bound to TBG, it's inactive. So T3 and T4 that's not bound to TBG is referred to as free T3 or free T4. And that's going to be important because the free T3 or free T4 are the metabolically active hormone. T3 is more active than T4, about three to four times more active, uh, but the two can be interconverted. Primary hypothyroidism is, is hypothyroidism that's caused by the thyroid itself, so decreased thyroid hormone due to decreased production. Because you have low T3 and T4, you're going to have a high TSH because you have decreased inhibitory feedback on the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. T3 and T4 would normally cause the TSH production to go down. And so a low T3 and T4 and a high TSH is characteristic of primary hypothyroidism. Secondary or tertiary hypothyroidism is decreased thyroid hormone due to decreased stimulation of the thyroid. Now, the decreased stimulation can be due to decreased TSH or due to decreased TRH. Remember, TRH comes from the hypothalamus and stimulates the production of TSH. TSH comes from the anterior pituitary and stimulates the thyroid to produce thyroid hormone. So, if you have decreased TSH, that would occur both in secondary and tertiary hypothyroidism, um, but decreased TRH would only occur in tertiary hypothyroidism. So if you have a decreased production of TRH from the, uh, from the uh, hypothalamus, then you're going to have a decreased amount of TSH because it's decreasing your stimulation of the anterior pituitary, and you're also going to have a low T3 and low T4. If you just have secondary hypothyroidism, so the anterior pituitary, you're going to have a high TRH because there's nothing wrong with that and the decreased negative feedback is going to increase the TRH, but you have a decreased TSH because the disease is at the anterior pituitary and then you'll also have a low T3 and T4 because you have decreased stimulation of the thyroid. The symptoms of hypothyroidism, there are a lot of them. Goiter is uh, going to be one of your sort of universal symptoms of hypothyroidism because you've got uh, the, thi the thyroid is going to be trying to, uh, trying to produce more thyroid hormone. So goiter is a, a, uh, a symptom of hypothyroidism and then uh, your symptoms related to your low T3 and T4, uh, which, which would include fatigue, cold intolerance, cramping and stiffness, carpal tunnel syndrome, weight gain despite decreased appetite, constipation, brittle hair, dry skin, edema, slow tendon reflexes, menorrhagia, galacteria, large tongue, and pseudodementia. I bold-faced the ones that I think are probably the most important to remember that come up the most on the test. Uh, I want to highlight though galacteria. Remember that uh, well, galacteria would only be a, a, a symptom of, uh, of primary hypothyroidism. And remember that TRH, well I suppose primary and secondary hypothyroidism. Remember that TRH stimulates the production of TSH and prolactin. So if you have decreased thyroid hormone, it's going to increase your TRH because of the decreased negative feedback. And if you have increased TRH, you have an increased production of prolactin. So that can cause galacteria. Of course, that would only happen in women. It wouldn't happen to a noticeable extent in men. But the prolactin can also cause decreased libido and so forth. Okay, so this is just an overview of the things that can cause hypothyroidism. Most of these we talk about in different sections. Primary hypothyroidism, of course, is a high TSH and low T3 and T4. The number one cause in the U.S. is Hashimoto's thyroiditis or Hashimoto's syndrome. 
uh, drug-induced hypothyroidism is another possibility. The uh, I would say the number one drug you come across in clinical practice is lithium because it's so commonly prescribed for bipolar disorder. Amiodarone is a, another frequent cause of drug-induced hypothyroidism. Remember, it can also cause drug-induced hyperthyroidism as well. Sulfa drugs and acetylsalicylic acid are other causes of hypothyroidism, but that's a little less common. Any thyroiditis can cause or hypothyroidism. Getting radioactive iodine ablation therapy for Graves' disease or another hyperthyroid disease will uh, undoubtedly cause hypothyroidism, and so those patients will have to be supplemented with levothyroxine. And then iodine deficiency is the number one cause of hypothyroidism worldwide. But that's not so common in the U.S. because we have iodized salt. Secondary and tertiary hypothyroidism. Remember, of course, you'll have a low TSH, and that should say a low T3 and T4. Um, and that could be due to tumor, mass effect, and so forth. And often it's associated with decreased levels of other hormones, too. So if you have a tumor, it's often not just going to affect thyroid hormone alone. It's going to uh, affect uh, luteinizing hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, ACTH, and so forth. Some of the complications of hypothyroidism include hypercholesterolemia uh, and myxedema coma which is an uncommon but emergent crisis of hypothyroidism. Another complication would be uh, hyponatremia. Okay, so Hashimoto's thyroiditis is hypothyroidism due to autoimmune destruction of the thyroid gland. This is analogous to Addison's disease in the uh, adrenals. And this is the number one cause of hypothyroidism in the U.S. It used to be... I, uh, uh, it used to be iodine deficiency, but now that we've started iodizing salt, now we uh, uh, don't have uh, endemic goiter as much as we used to. So this is now the number one cause of hypothyroidism in the U.S. It predominates in females by a significant margin of about 10 to 15 to 1, and the average age of onset is about 30 to 40 years. When it presents in males, it's usually a little bit older. It is rather common. It affects approximately one in a thousand people, so you will come across this in your clinical practice. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is associated with other autoimmune disorders such as lupus, RA, primary biliary cirrhosis, psoriatic arthritis, and so forth. It is, like other autoimmune disorders, mediated by antibodies, and those antibodies are uh, antithyroid peroxidase, anti-TPO, and antithyroglobulin, anti-TG. The complications are the same as any hypothyroidism, and that is hypercholesterolemia and hyponatremia, possibly myxedema coma, and anemia of chronic disease like any inflammatory disorder. So the symptoms of Hashimoto's is going to be hypothyroid symptoms. So remember, that that's waking, decreased appetite, intolerance to cold, lethargy, constipation, menorrhagia, galacteria, and so forth. Goiter, uh, because of the increased stimulation uh, by TSH. Rarely, Hashimoto's can present with hyperthyroid symptoms, and that's because of the uh, acute destruction. So if you catch this in its very, very, very early stage, like any inflammatory thyroiditis, you can, uh, you'll have hyperthyroid symptoms because the destruction of the thyroid will cause a spilling out of the T3 and T4 that's stored, and so that's going to cause hyperthyroid symptoms acutely. Eventually, this will devolve into hypothyroidism. So a lot of times, the patients don't present with the hyperthyroid symptoms. They're just subclinical. Um, they don't present until they go on into the chronic stages where they'll have hypothyroid symptoms. When they present with hyperthyroid symptoms and the cause is due to Hashimoto's thyroiditis, the term that's used for that is Hashi toxicosis. So you may hear that term thrown around. On physical exam, with uh, hypothyroidism in general, you see an enlarged thyroid due to increased TSH stimulation, uh, bradycardia, cool and dry skin, brittle hair and nails, and a decreased tendon reflexes. For any patient with 
presenting with hypo or hyperthyroid symptoms, the best initial test is going to be a TSH level, and that uh, will also include a T3 and T4, but most importantly, a TSH level. And remember that Hashimoto's thyroiditis, because it's primary, you're going to have a low T3 and T4 and a high TSH because the disease is not in the hypothalamus or in the anterior pituitary, it's in the thyroid itself. So a diagnosis of Hashimoto's will be presumptive based on your labs and based on the history. The fact that this is somewhat... Uh, uh, sort of is a chronic disease, there's no pain in the goiter, uh, and so forth, that this is also the number one cause as well. And um, it doesn't happen in children. So if you have a child that presents with hypothyroid symptoms, not Hashimoto's. So think of iodine deficiency if it's a child. The diagnosis can and often is corroborated with serology for anti-TPO and antithyroglobulin antibodies. So uh, that would further support your diagnosis. However, the most accurate test for Hashimoto's thyroiditis, because it is an inflammatory disease, is going to be a thyroid biopsy, in which case you'll see lymphocytic uh, infiltration of the thyroid tissue. The treatment, as it is for any chronic hypothyroidism, is going to be daily thyroid hormone replacement, and that's with oral levothyroxine. These are some symptoms that you can see in hypothyroidism. So here on the right is the goiter, which is visible. Uh, you've got a uh, alopecia here on this woman in the left, and then macroglossia, this enlarged tongue. Okay, myxedema coma is a life-threatening complication, and um, this is... Uh, very uncommon, but when it does happen, it is an emergency. So oftentimes, uh, well, this will always be in a patient with hypothyroidism, whether it's known or unknown, but it's generally precipitated by some kind of physiologic insult, and we need to identify that physiologic insult to, uh, to complete our treatment. So the symptoms of myxedema coma are going to be the existence of hypothyroid symptoms both uh, in the patient uh, at right now and in the history. And in addition to hypothyroid symptoms, what makes myxedema coma or myxedema crisis uh, its own disorder is that you're going to have a decreased level of consciousness, altered mental status, possibly delirium, stupor, lethargy, or indeed coma. Now, myxedema coma can be a little bit misleading as a term because you don't necessarily have to have coma to have the disease, so the term myxedema crisis is often used as well. Uh, there may be signs of pleural or pericardial effusion, so when you, uh, when you listen with your stethoscope, you may hear fine crackles and rails, you may hear distant heart sounds, and uh, vitally, the patient is going to tend to have a... Uh, a low normal or low blood pressure, uh, bradycardia, hypo, uh, hypothermia, and uh, decreased respiration rate. So the first step in diagnosis is going to be uh, a TSH level. Now note that I didn't say the first step in management. If you have a patient that comes in with signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, uh, altered level of consciousness, lethargy and they've got a decreased respiration rate and let's say uh, on their pulse oximetry you've got 85 percent or 80 percent oxygenation clearly this is a patient that's uh, not oxygenating and so the next best step is going to be intubation however the best first step in diagnosis is going to be a TSH level now the TSH level can be either high or low because this can be caused from primary, secondary, or tertiary uh, hypothyroidism. But you're always going to have a low or even undetectable T3 and T4. Now on labs, you uh, are going to run into what the possible uh, what the possible precipitating cause is. So on CBC, you may see an elevated white blood cell count with left shift. That would indicate an infection. You may see an anemia. That would show a uh, presence of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. 
On metabolic profile, you're often going to see hyponatremia, and almost always you're going to see an elevated creatinine, which is a sign of renal impairment. So the treatment for myxedema coma is going to be immediate IV therapy with levothyroxine. And of course, that's assuming that the patient is uh, stable. So if they are decompensating, if they have low oxygen levels and they're not breathing, uh, then of course you're going to intubate them. But the immediate therapy for the disease itself is going to be IV therapy with levothyroxine. And that's IV therapy with levothyroxine. And the reason is because in hypothyroidism and particularly in myxedema crisis, you have a low GI absorption. So you don't want to wait for absorption as even though absorption can, can be fast, it's not fast enough. And so you need to give IV levothyroxine in patients with myxedema crisis. And then you're going to correct the underlying cause uh, if it's present, and generally there is an underlying cause. Supportive care is useful, so keeping the patient in a warm, um, a warm room, for instance, and uh, of course, like I mentioned, intubation, if the patient is unresponsive and has a decreased respiration rate or low oxygen saturation. A lot of the times the patient is going to have hyponatremia. If severe hyponatremia is present, uh, for instance, of less than 125, then you're going to uh, administer normal saline. And I would be cautious, but generally 3% uh, 3% NaCl, sorry, I didn't mean normal saline. 3% NaCl is going to be uh, effective enough. You don't want to administer normal saline boluses uh, because there is a possibility that the patient could have congestive heart failure due to uh, pericardial effusion. So uh, normal saline is not indicated. You would want to judiciously administer 3%. NACL. You should cautiously replace glucose with D50 and of course that's going to depend how cautious you are is going to depend on what their glucose level is. So if it's 25 you're going to be a little bit more liberal than if it's 60. And you can use uh, D50 for that. Um, at the same time, once you've got the patient stabilized, you should be working up for the underlying cause. Remember, the underlying cause is often infection. It could be trauma. It could be a heart attack. It could be low cortisol. Oftentimes, that's going to be in patients with secondary or tertiary hypothyroidism. It could be, uh, it could be drugs, so certain drugs that can cause myxedema coma or precipitate myxedema coma include sedatives. Um, like benzodiazepines, uh, anesthetics, narcotics, amiodarone, beta blockers. So if any of those drugs have been used, that's a possible cause. Um, you should get EKG and cardiac enzymes um, to check to see if there uh, was a myocardial infarction that may have precipitated it. Chest x-ray is useful as well. Uh, because that can, uh, that can indicate if there's a, uh, well, one, it can indicate if there's pleural effusion going on, but it can, also, uh, it can also show if there's any pneumonia present. And as far as what you're going to do with the patient, once you're st you've stabilized them and you've gotten the workup started for the underlying cause, these patients all need to be admitted to the ICU uh, like any patient would be if they're intubated. Regardless, you're going to admit them to the ICU. They should be on cardiac monitoring because there is an increased risk, particularly in the older patients that this presents with, there's an increased risk of myocardial infarction. And oftentimes, you're going to want to place a Swan-Ganz catheter to me me measure your uh, central venous pressure. And uh, that should be enough for myxedema coma. It's not too common, but as long as you know this stuff, you should be good. And that's it.